welcome everyone to, today, to today's Art Speak lecture featuring artist and FIT alumna, Abigail DeVille. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, this is the 2014-2015 Art Speak series. Uh, Art Speak is an interdisciplinary program presented by the Departments of Fine Arts and the History of Art, and includes a series of lectures and a panel discussion, this season's Art Speak, on the theme of outside traditions. This series is open to the FIT community and the public so you can bring your friends. And we encourage that. Uh, the Art Speak Committee would like to thank Dean Joanne Arbuckle, Dean of the School of Art and Design, and Scott Stoddart, Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, for their generous support and commitment to this program, and the Student Faculty Corporation for making this event possible. We also thank our chairs, Stephanie Demanuel from Fine Arts, and David Drogan from History of Art, and Anna Blum, Associate Chair of Art History and Museum Professions, for their support as well. Thank you very much. Before introducing our speaker, and I know um, you all are very anxious to hear from her, I'd like to mention an upcoming project that is part of this year's Art Speak program. So fine arts and art history museum profession students are collaborating on an exhibition based on this year's theme. The exhibition will take place this coming spring in the FIT library. Fine arts students are currently making artwork and AHEM students will curate the work and write text for the exhibition and a catalog. Photography students are producing documentary photos and videos, and communications design students will design the catalog. So we're really crossing over to a lot of different departments. So look for the ArtSpeak exhibition in the library this coming spring. For their guidance and support on the exhibition catalog project, we thank CJ Ye, Christy Shin, and Chair Susanna Nushin from Communications Design, and Curtis Willex and Chair Ron Amato from Photography. We also thank NJ Wolf and the library staff for their support for the Art Speak exhibition. All right, so Abigail. Abigail DeVille received her MFA from Yale University in 2011 and her BFA from FIT in 2007. She has exhibited a growing constellation of site-specific installations in the United States and in Europe. Her most recent exhibitions include Material Histories at the Studio Museum in Harlem, 2014, Outside the Lines at the Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, 2014, Invisible Men Beyond the Veil, Gallery Michel Yen, per Paris, 2013, and the Future Generation Art Prize at the 55th Venice Biennale, 2013. The television and film series R21 recently produced a video profile on her for their New York close-up series, which you can watch online on their site. Her work has been written about in New York Magazine, The New York Times, and artforum.com. Ms. DeVille is a 2012 Joan Mitchell Foundation grant recipient and is a 2014-15 fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. So without further ado, I give you Abigail DeVille. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. I really appreciate it. And thank you, FIT family. It's such a joy to be back and to share with you guys what I've been doing the last seven years. But um, yeah, so uh, I don't like to talk a lot. And there's a lot of images. And uh, I'm going to start out with showing you the things that I think about when I'm conceiving work and the things that I'm constantly meditating on. So here's a couple of clips. That. You might be thinking, what does that have to do with anything? But um, I like to think about our time, our place in history, and 
the 13 billion years from the birth of the universe to this present moment. And that there's a, a statistic that says that 5% of our bodies is made up of the same elements that are found in stardust. So thinking about the cyclical nature of time and how everything is absolutely connected to one another. And then in the same, in the same vein, I'm, I'm deeply interested in genealogy and thinking about the past and thinking about how we carry, not only do we carry around elements that were first birthed in the first few moments after the uh, Big Bang in our bodies, but then also the genealogical information from our ancestors of, of like the last 500 years just casually. And thinking about how all of those things inform our decisions from day to day <coughs> and how um, there's this spatial relationship that I'm deeply concerned with in thinking about the claustrophobic spaces of urban interiors like a tiny apartment in the Bronx somewhere versus the infinite expanse of the universe and how those two things are intrinsically connected, how everything is connected. So I'm from the Bronx and um, in, uh, I think, well, I don't know if you know, but in the, the 1960s, 70s, there was a uh, massive white flight and uh, arson for hire, and there was, on average, 11, 11 fires a night, and people still lived in the, in the buildings that were there that were burned down. And I'm also really deeply concerned with the invisible histories that are in the spaces that we traverse from day to day. So you know how you casually walk by a corner store or something, but then thinking about the history of that, that particular location or that spot for the last 150 or 200 years and what residue or, or secrets does that place possibly contain. Like this is Hell's Kitchen back in the day. So these are actually paintings. These are a series of paintings that I made uh, from about 2007, like right when I graduated from FIT to about 2009, they were called Universal Diagrams of Discourse. And I was thinking about the death of hip hop and all the things that happened in that particular moment that caused this burst of energy, to cause this new form to come into existence. And thinking about the decay of specific social structures in the Bronx. And then at the same time, I started thinking about cosmology as a compositional device. So I think of black holes in particular as a metaphor for historical erasure, since black holes are absence of light and they're invisible, nobody can see what they are anyway, they can be anything that you want them to be. I think I started this painting here, maybe in the hallway. Um, and it's called OG, Original Gangsters. Oh yeah, this one I did, it started in Jeff Boyce's class, I think. <laughs> it was called Real Hip Hop with a question mark. This um, I made immediately after graduating from FIT, and it, the whole time I was here, you guys know the limitations of space, but I was making stuff on the floor, and this is the first thing I made on the wall. Uh, it was a painting, it's called 449, and it was made up of my grandmother's lotto tickets that I collected over a period of time. And that's what all the little pink and white things are. And 449 is the first number that she hit. And the bottom is a, is a depiction of the Bronx neighborhood that she lived in for 40 years. And it's called Heirloom, and there's a portrait of my grandmother in it. But then at this time, I was using a lot of birds thinking about displacement, thinking about migratory movements of people and the progression of time. Uh, this is called What Happens to a Dream Deferred dot 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 supernova. And this I made in 2009 at the Bronx River Art Center. So after I graduated from FIT, I had a studio at the Bronx River Art Center for two years. And I taught kids there from about ages five to 21 or so. And I was also simultaneously working at a charter school in Harlem, teaching second and third graders after school. So it really changed my perspective on how I was conceptualizing work and, and what it made things really crystal clear as to what was vitally important for me to communicate through the forms that I was making, the things that I was using. And then I also started lifting the kids' work and it started getting um, incorporated into my own. But this was the first time that I started maybe constructing a space more three-dimensionally from, from two-dimensional paintings. So it's about three paintings that were cut up and uh, con reconfigured in the corner of this room. 
And this is a series of works that I did based on uh, my grandmother and thinking about kind of the, the black hole that's, I, I don't want to say the American experience, but there's lots of holes in information and, and what's recorded and what's not recorded, what's unrecorded. And so everyone has in their family secrets and things that they don't know or maybe they can't count past two generations or so, but this is me going through her things and using some of her old photographs and reconstructing a, a fictional narrative in my mind of possibly what the past in, in Richmond, Virginia could have been like. And that's a picture of her when she was a kid at a what do they call it? I don't know, a thumb, thumb something wedding. <laughs> I think it's something they did in the Baptist church where they would have kids do uh, pretend weddings as if they were promised to uh, the person that they were marrying, you know, when they grow up or whatever. Uh, this was uh, an image of my grandmother and her mother, the, the one that's flipped up upside down on... Uh, on 135th Street in front of the YMCA in 1943 on Easter Sunday. And then in the corner is my grandmother's grandfather, and he was the first person who came north from Richmond, Virginia, and had a barber shop in, in Harlem. So that's him. That's my grandmother in the corner. And then about 2009, when I was in grad school, I started thinking about well, could you actually suspend time in an object? Like, if you actually broke, could you, is it possible to break down an object to its actual essence so that it could, like, harken back to the birth of the universe? And so, I, from, from newer collages in that series, I, well, that specifically is a tile that I ripped off my grandmother's bathroom floor, but then I used an image of these two possible relatives that I have no idea who they are, what their names are, and started really digging into the material and trying to talk about universal time. The same thing here in the bottom tile is uh, my dad trimming the tree with, at Christmas when he was a kid. This one's called Over the Rainbow. It's Harlem. I found that canvas actually on 134th Street in the trash, and it was just this beige canvas with these two little girls, the image repeating uh, three times and burnt at the edges, and I thought it was such a sad attempt at a painting that it needed to be rescued. So I took it and I rubbed all this dirt on it and uh, paired it with a portable television that was my grandmother's, has a really nice nicotine patina on it, and they both work really well together. This was uh, some cigarettes of my grandmother's that I collected over maybe a six month period of time whenever I, I remember to do it, but making like a, like a cosmos of, of the evidence of her existence since she, you know, she breathed through those things. It's the evidence of a life lived. Yeah, is that better? Yeah? Okay. Uh, this one's called Turner, and I was thinking about romanticism in 19th century painting and thinking about Turner, but then also Caspar David Friedrich and thinking about uh, the, the, that same spatial relationship I, I stated before with the claustrophobic space of urban interiors. But at this moment in 2009, I think it was when they turned off the signal and made everybody get digital cable, and so my grandmother's television became worthless. So. Uh, I took it from her, and when you turn down the television and it emits that high frequency sound, it's left over from the Big Bang. It's called Oil and Money. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I made this to make fun of collectors, and this is the stuff that they love, you know. But it's uh, motor oil doused paper with uh, charcoal dust and some scanned and real <laughs> money put it put it in there it's called harlem world so that has some of uh, my my children's artwork <laughs> that i kept uh, 
but it was based on this project that I made. I had uh, these second and third graders do in Harlem where they had to create their own superheroes and they had to answer three questions, which were, what were their superpowers, where do they come from, and what do they do for the community? And then they collaboratively constructed uh, paintings that we all, that they made together, and then I kept all of them and, and made my own version. And then the Blackbirds are still talking about redevelopment and displacement. This is me destroying something, trying to make that connection back to the beginning of everything. This is the first, um, first installation I did at my studio in grad school, and it was called New York at Dawn, and it was based on a Garcia Lorca poem, and you know, I thought it was cute, uh, my middle name is Dawn, so she has my face, but there was this line in the poem where he talks about the sun rising over the black putrid waters, and talking about birds, and at that, that moment, that whole time period leading up to this, I had been using birds as, as stand-ins for people. And then there's, like a, there's a black hole behind her and she's standing on top of an American flag. This is the first site-specific installation I made in Philadelphia in 2010. And so I was there for about two weeks and I, it was called Gold Mountain. I researched the history of Chinatowns and I didn't know anything about that before that, but um, about how they were regula regulated to be in certain parts of the city and that they were only permitted to have, uh, you know, like laundromats and dry cleaning businesses and Chinese food restaurants, basically. And, and they weren't even allowed to bring women over from China to, to marry until after World War II. So they were basically uh, bachelor towns. But it was called Gold Mountain because um, originally when they came, they thought they were going to you know, look for gold in California, strike it rich and go back to China and live like kings. They didn't have any intention of staying here, but they, because of so much racism, they weren't uh, permitted to do any of that. And then, so that's the first black hole that happened here. It's called Dark Star. This was in uh, recess down in Soho in uh, 2010, but I was thinking about if a history of a people could be contained within a rock and that rock exploded, what, what would that history look like? And so that's what's like spilled out all, all over the walls. And that's like a <laughs> black hole pit, that's that, uh, just deflated and, and thrown into the crit space at school. And this is my thesis at, uh, at Yale in 2011, and it's called Genesis. So the, the, during the time period while I was at Yale, through uh, interlibrary loan, I found books of my grandfather's poetry. And he, was, he died when I was two months old in the Dominican Republic, and the books of poetry were written in Spanish, but I had some friends help me translate, and it turns out he was writing about the cosmos, which really flipped me out. And, um, which I'm actually trying to make more of a, a conscious relationship to do something with, with that. But then that goes back to the, my original statement about thinking about how does genealogy affect what you care about or what you think about? Because I never met him, right? He saw a picture of me when he was dying. So how is it that we had similar thoughts or interests with you know, somebody you never even met? This was an installation I did at the New Museum in 2012. Uh, it was part of a show called The Ungovernables, but the, the installation was called Dark Day and it was based on this documentary that was shot, I think in 1999, 2000, about the quote unquote mole people that were living in the underground uh, near these Amtrak train tunnels and these people, you know, it was shot in black and white because somebody told them, they got, they got donated film, they got all this equipment and someone told them, if you don't know what you're doing, you shoot it in color, you can just screw it all up. Like, the whole thing is going to be unwatchable. So they shot it in black and white. It's extremely beautiful. It's this people taking ownership and authenticity of their own story, telling it for themselves. And it was just a family. They had running water, electricity, furniture. And uh, so I was thinking about the space on the Bowery and how and the Bowery for over, I think, over 100 years was really a notorious place for gang violence and for, you know, the dregs of society or whatever, you know, 
to be, but there's, there's smaller and smaller spaces that allow for that here in the city. And um, I'm not calling the new museum a gentrifying force, but it's you know right next to the historic Bowery Mission. And so the space that I had in the museum was between the third and fourth floor, and it was 30 feet up. So I was thinking about that this thing could be easily overlooked if you didn't, didn't happen to go down that stairwell. And so that was also part of it. But I, I scavenged this dumpster that was behind my grandmother's apartment building in the Bronx and suspended trash 30 feet the length of the, the space. Call Hooverville Torque Ellipse, my uh, my cardboard Sarah. <laughs> oh, this is called Invisible Men. This was another project that would recess at Red Hook in uh, 2012, I think. So my grandmother passed away in December 2011, and then in 2012, I was really using a lot of her things, uh, thinking about um, invisibility and reconstructing domestic spaces or little black holes. That's what one of the other installations was. This was an installation I did in Los Angeles in, at Night Gallery in 2012, and it was called, it's called a really long title that I can never remember. Is that if I don't think I'm sinking, look at what a hole I'm in there is. So I was there for about a week, uh, and I harassed the, the, one of the gallery owners. We drove around the freeway uh, and got stuff off of uh, free Craigslist and amassed a bunch of junk. But while we were riding around, it was interesting to me to see how homeless people were living in LA versus how they live in New York. And so there was this one moment we, we were driving underneath some underpass, and right at the top of the underpass, there was, um, you know, that crawl space up there, right? Somebody had like completely covered it with cardboard and was like living along at the top of the crawl space. So the, my, my idea was just this, thinking about this invisible class of people or this invisible race of people that kind of crash landed in, in uh, East LA because that's where the uh, gallery was. It was between a, a taco stand and a, and a, beauty, uh, a beauty salon on a, a little strip. And what was amazing to me is that <laughs> People in the art community there thought it was disingenuous, but like people from the community came in and some woman, the owner from the beauty salon was just like, is this about homelessness? Like instantly, you know? This, uh, this is an installation I did at the uh, Pinchuk Art Center in Kiev in 2012, and it was uh, called Street Life of Vortex, and it was based on a Klaus Oldenburg uh, installation that he did at Judson Gallery, I think, I don't remember the year right now, but it was a radical installation. He ran around uh, combing the streets of East Village and he picked up just trash and he made objects in response to the world around and his life in the East Village. And so this was my, my 2012 Kiev version of that. And it was great because they don't have any trash in <laughs> Kiev at all. So they just kept taking me to landfills and, um, it's just mostly food trash. And the stuff that you did find, like driving around the housing districts, were, was like furniture that was 50 years old. And this was a scandal. <laughs> the, the workers there, and they were really tough. They were so hardcore. Like, I don't know why, but they, there was like painters painting at 3 a.m. or, you know, women cleaning the bathrooms at like 4 o'clock in the morning that I would see at like 10 o'clock in the morning. So I don't know when these people slept or where they lived or what was going on, but um, they did not want to move that trash. They didn't want to touch it. They didn't want to bring it into the museum. They had a lot to say about it. <laughs> So uh, it was just a, a hexagon intersecting vortex. 
This is called uh, Harlem Tower of Babel. This was at the Studio Museum in the fall of 2012. And I was thinking about the never-ending struggle of a certain specific class of, of New Yorkers. And so the stuff that's on the outside of the sculpture is from a beach in South Brooklyn called Dead Horse Bay. And there's, there was a community there that got bulldozed out to the ground by uh, Robert Moses. And for some reason, there's still trash on that beach that's from the 30s. So there's like Depression era Clorox bottles and all these other things. And so that's what's covering the outside of the sculpture. And then it, and the inside is uh, things that belong to my grandmother and it's from like the latter part of the 20th century. This is an installation I did in Chicago in uh, 2013. And it was in Rogers Park. There's a collector who has a 19th century converted carriage house in his backyard, and he has it as a project space. So I was there eating steak, living in his house for two weeks. <laughs> and um, so Rogers Avenue, Rogers Park, is, is this really sharp diagonal that goes from Lake Michigan into you know, the interior of Rogers Park. But it was originally an Indian trail, and then it was the original uh, trail drawn by, uh, or line, demarcation line, drawn by the settlers and, and natives. So north of that line, natives were regulated, and below that is where settlers were, were settling. But again, thinking about, and then I, fortunately I, I, I found, not fortunately, but unfortunately, fortunately, there was a, an apartment building that was, had just gone under foreclosure, and that's where all of these materials came from in the neighborhood. So all the interiors were being gutted and I, I was able to take all of this stuff. But thinking about the continual displacement of people and the, the cyclical nature of time in, in American history. And this is the piece that I had at the Venice Biennale last year. It was called Wild Seed. This was in Vancouver at Artspeak in, I think fall, yeah, September 2013. And so Artspeak is this not-for-profit project space there in Vancouver in Gastown. And Gastown is the oldest settled place in uh, Vancouver and it was started by uh, a sea captain that talked too much, his name was Gassy Jack. And so that's why it's called Gastown. But um, this rectangle that recedes back into the space was the original dimensions of the saloon that he opened there in the 1860s. And I think Gastown is also has the highest like drug use and it's the poorest uh, district in all of Columbia, well, not British Columbia, yes, but in all of Canada. Um, and it's been notorious for drug problems since like the 19th century. But um, they try to clean it up a little bit for the 2010 uh, Winter Olympics. And so it's, it's a really stark contrast of what's happening outside of the gallery in terms of like there's um, tons of, there's hundreds of people living in the street. And I mean, the, the beautiful thing about it is that I've never seen that many, it was like rainbow tribe of like homeless <laughs> drug addicts. I've never seen that many people like living together. And it was the first time that I'd seen uh, really First Nations people. So the material there, the, the garbage there was really heavily picked over because of the neighborhood that it was in. So I didn't feel comfortable taking any trash from the usual way that I collected because you just knew it belonged to someone. Every time I saw something that was halfway interested, I knew somebody, it was somebody's. And so I, I ended up taking um, material from a roof that had been torn down in an alleyway. And so it actually becomes the, the material of, of gentrification and this is the, the show that was in Paris last October. Um, I think it was called Invisible Men, but the, the idea was that I had these three stalls and in them I chose a word to, to describe uh, American history. So this is creation. This one is uh, subjugation. And then this one was negation.
And then this year, <laughs> I've started doing, uh, collaborating with a friend of mine, a theater director named Charlotte Brathwaite, and we've been doing different projects, but this is for a Sunrise project that we're developing that's gonna be at La Mama next spring. So I made that little broken glass ball. It was like a, a weather balloon that was telling us Sun Ra's uh, locations. Then this was uh, a set for a play called She Talks to Beethoven that was at Jack in Brooklyn, I think in, in January, last January. And the play was an Adrian Kennedy play. She's an African-American playwright. She wrote this play that takes place in the 1960s in Ghana. And this woman is uh, an African-American woman and her husband, they're both professors in writing and collaborating on a play about Beethoven. And her husband is, you know, black, black freedom radical and he's missing. And so there's different parts where it's disrupted and you hear like radio cat, broadcasting where his possible whereabouts are. She doesn't know if he's alive or if he's dead. And she's kind of losing her marbles and closed in this space, uh, thinking that she's speaking to Beethoven. And so it was based on another Sarah sculpture, but I, I used uh, plywood theater flats. And so the audience had to walk around the entire time inside and outside the sculpture. This, uh, this is a set I did this summer for um, Peter Sellers directed A Midsummer Night's Dream at the Stratford, Ontario Festival. And uh, because of Charlotte, I was able to come in on that project and, uh, and I did the installation for the show. So that's where the audience sat in the midst of that sea of debris. And this is a show that's up, closing on Sunday <laughs> at the uh, Studio Museum. It's called uh, A <laughs> ADD Obelisk. And so I was thinking about the Washington Monument. This is called Double Invisibility. And these are uh, shots from the last R21 video that, I, that was released called Harlem Stories. But I went around the streets and, and claiming and marking territory that I had a familial attachment to because my grandfather was born in Harlem in 1930. And then also this site specifically I chose because uh, somewhere in and around here is unmarked uh, African burial ground at the base of the Willis Avenue Bridge. And so I built something in response to that. So this is a head that, uh, of mine that I dropped off at, at the, uh, the building that's now, that's now standing where my grandfather was, was born. I dropped another head where I think he owned a TV repair shop in the 1960s. And that's where my grandmother lived uh, across the street from him. This is up at El Museo right now. It's called Bronx Floor, so this is my, uh, my answer to Gordon Matta-Clark. And then this is a sculpture that's up right now at the Sculpture Center. And it's called uh, Gone Forever, Ever Present. In Washington, D.C., I did a public art project, and it was called The New Migration, but here's a little clip. I instantly felt a connection to Anacostia because of the people that were here felt like a neighborhood, it felt like a community, and every place that we went just felt very fresh. And then we went to the Phillips Collection towards the end of the day, and the part of the Jacob Lawrence migration series was up. I instantly knew what I wanted the project to be. And so that's why I titled it The New Migration, thinking about the cycle of movement of African Americans in this country, but then you know how the Great Migration started right around World War I and continued until about 1970, but then, you know, because of redevelopment, especially aggressively, I think in the last 15 years, 
rents have skyrocketed, kind of corporation things have, have come in. People are no longer able to live or sustain the communities that they helped build 100 years ago. And so that's what the, the New Migration Project is all about. Thinking about the hopes that people carried with them from the South moving forward. Think about the constant movement, the constant moving forward, pushing forward and the things that were left behind, the things that you take with you. <laughs> the grad school question, how did I get there and how was my time at, at Yale? Um, when I was graduating from FIT, I didn't know what else to do but to go to grad school, kind of. I, I kind of got panicky and really wanted to get into a grad program right after school, but I definitely wasn't ready for it. And so I applied to three schools, and that was the only school that I got an interview for. And then as like a, a last minute thing, I applied to Skowhegan as well. And I didn't get into grad school, but I got into Skowhegan, which really, really was a life-changing summer for me. I, um, the work just changed immediately, and I was challenged by uh, the people that I was meeting, and I made some really good friends that summer. And so I think after that, then the decisions that I made after that kind of led me to, to going to grad school. I, have it, I had every intention of wanting to go. For some reason, I thought that there were just, there were things that I didn't know. But <laughs> I think what I didn't know was how much I already did already innately know in terms of having a source or a place of where work is being generated from. And people can't teach you really how to do that, right? Or how to be self-motivated and, and, and passionate about making work. I think my time at Yale was necessary and it was needful. And again, I made some really great friends, but I think it's also interesting to see the kind of lenses and view the way that the work is gonna be uh, disseminated when it goes out into the world and how actually how simple people are and how lazy they are in terms of looking or and thinking. And so that was eye-opening too. You know, people look at you and they think they know what something means because of your race, your gender, or, or have ideas about where you're coming from and they're not actually really looking at the work. And so um, I think all of that was really needful and helpful. Yeah, I taught in Harlem and in the Bronx. That was fantastic. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> and I, it's funny to me is that I haven't really taught since I graduated grad school. So I, and yeah. But I don't know, there's just this uh, immense joy that comes from teaching, for me anyway, that almost like kind of a high that you can't really get from, from other things. Well, no one's gonna make you do it. Like, if you don't get up in the morning and do something, it's not gonna get done. If you don't make it, it's not gonna happen. So either you're gonna be generating work or you're not gonna, you're not. And then no one's gonna really be interested. Um, so, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? You're your own boss and that's kind of wonderful, but then you could also be a really terrible boss. So, um, I mean, I think that's, that's the difficulty in trying to figure out how to structure Things that are, I, I guess, you know, I guess normal, like a paycheck every two weeks or something, or health insurance and um, things like that. I mean, if you don't really care about all of that, then you should really pursue the arts. <laughs> but if you're the type of person that's going to freak out because you don't know where, uh, you know, your rent's coming from the next month, then you know, you might not want to pursue the arts. Um, I think also it's good to be self-reflective and thinking and critical of yourself and critical of, of are you actually challenging yourself and asking yourself questions about the things that you're making. And I think that's really vital in, in terms of moving forward. <laughs> I 
Well, there was one crew where I was really bratty and I kept looking at the clock and people were like laughing at me afterwards because I was rolling my eyes so hard. And I think uh, Rob Store fell asleep in the crit and, uh, and somebody else was being really kind of ignorant. But uh, I, I don't know, I just took it in stride. I, didn't, I wasn't combative, I didn't really say much to anyone and I didn't, I didn't come back with like guns blazing. I just took it as, as an understanding of, well, this is, this is what it is. This is exactly how much time or consideration somebody's gonna give to something. Yeah, as a fact of, of how work is viewed, yeah. Well, you, no, I go to places and I just show up mostly and I, I don't really bring anything with me. And so then I'm there and I'm trying to experience this space and then I'm doing, walk, like walking around the neighborhood and then doing actual research, like going to a bookstore and buying some books and thinking about the history of that place and then I'll latch on to a specific fact. And then that's, once I have the reason why, I have to answer a series of questions for myself as to why am I making this, why does it need to exist in this way, and what am I trying to communicate through this specific form? And once I've answered that for myself, then I'll start looking for trash, and then I'll start making the piece. But I don't make anything without being able to ask myself or answer those questions for myself. I do that. I call Jason a lot. <laughs> like a lot of those installations, Jason helped. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's like always last minute scrambling, looking for people. I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have like an assistant or anything like that. Hmm? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Keenholz, yeah, definitely, and uh, and David Hammonds, and um, yeah, a little bit more. I think more undergrad than 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 grad, but yeah. I think I thought Keenholz was great when I really started like learning about him and finding out all the things that he was doing off of trades, and that really works, you know, like. <laughs> He got, he got a lot of dental work done for, uh, for trades. And so, you know, I thought that was fantastic. And I, I put out a thing on Facebook, like, you know, I need dental work, you know. And I immediate response. And yeah, I owe friend's mom a painting, but yeah, it was, <laughs> that stuff worked. I think FIT gave me the time and space that I needed to develop, yeah. I think it was really about time and space, and I think um, undergrad is what you make it. Every experience is what you make it and what you can get out of it. And I think that I was really ambitious in what I was wanting to do, but I wasn't really thinking too tough. I, I really wasn't thinking, I was just making. And then the hard part, or the growing pain part, was the, the challenging myself to really think about why. Yeah. Well, I went to grad school because you have to go to grad school. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry to let you know that, but you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess back in the day, you could do whatever you want, and you could get people to come by your studio, and that was cool, and you and your friends could do shows, and then all of you end up being famous and stuff like that. It don't work like that anymore. Um, so if you want to you wanna be in a place where you can get your work in front of certain people that'll promote it, like I was in the New Museum show because there's this crazy collector named John Friedman who was stalking me my first year, at Yale, and he'd come by all the time. He ended up buying like 17 things for me, and I treated him really bad, he really liked it. 
And then, you know, there, one day I was at the new museum, and his name is in the elevator, and I didn't know that. And he was the reason why I was in the triennial show, and then that was the reason why other things happened. So um, I think you need to be in a place, make yourself available to be in a place where you can meet people. Like, uh, after I actually, after I graduated from Yale, people that didn't give me the time of day when I was just, you know, FIT graduate, living in the Bronx and have my studio in the Bronx. Like, people would flake out on studio visits all the time. They didn't want to go all the way up to the Bronx, whatever. And, like, people apologized to me afterwards, you know, after the triennial show. Because, I mean, what ra really radically changed in the two years? And, you know, I don't know, but the art world is elitist and, and superficial, so. They go to the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> Documentation is it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So have you been in I haven't been, but I'm trying to start. I almost don't know how to do that anymore. Um, but I, 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 all of a sudden, you know, I think, I think after Yale, I didn't want to make any paintings for a while. And so I think I, I'm, I'm finally over that. I've flushed it out of my system. And I'm ready to, to make some secret, secret work. <laughs> I think the community for me really gelled and came together from, from Skowhegan. And then, and then definitely it's been added on to. I've met a lot of amazing people that I talk to all the time, and we're always in each other's studios. We're going to see shows together and challenging each other and advocating for each other. And once you have a community network like that, then people tell other people about you, tell curators, collectors. Like I've gotten nominated for grants from friends who had gotten the grant, the same grants previously, so the community network really is, is everything. Is there a balance of what? I don't do all that anymore. No, I don't do that. I don't even know how to do that, actually. I'm really bad at that. I just, I, when, when, some, when I'm supposed to be acting like I'm impressed, I just, I, it must be the New Yorker in me. I, <laughs> I get really obnoxious and jerky. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do, I kind of do the opposite. So yeah, I need someone to advocate for me because I'm, I don't really do it for myself. And then really the work should be doing all of that, right? So once you get an opportunity, you just really work that opportunity so there can be follow up. I work till the security come kick you out. So whatever so, that uh, that cutoff time is. Whether or not they decide, <coughs> let me just put this out there for everybody to hear. A lot of people don't like criticism. Mm -hmm. Because they think that it's a work hard or harder. A lot of people like to just sort of buy. And what I want them to know is whether they believe in what the professor says to them or not, they have to work extremely yeah, I don't know if you can bottle that. Yeah, I don't I don't know, yeah, I think yes, yeah. 
I, I would agree with that. I think it'd be important to start asking yourself why you're doing what you're doing and start asking yourself questions. I mean, it's good to make things just to make and to practice and to learn and, and experiment with materials, but then you have to pinpoint at some point and, and ask yourself really tough questions about why I'm doing this, why does this thing need to exist, why am I doing it through this way? I mean, I don't really believe in um, and in and, and any specific kind of hierarchy of like importance of medium or something, like I'm not married to any medium, I think that the medium should really serve the concept and that should be the best way. And this is the best way for me to translate or to talk about this thing that I want to talk about. And I think that once you actually get to the core of why you want to make things or what it is that you're actually trying to communicate through the forms that you're using, then you can really with more determined kind of focus, zero in on, on creating your own voice and, and why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, it was after FIT and it was, I think, before grad school. Yeah, I don't think you should go to grad school if you don't know what you're doing. Or if you, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's helpful. Because, yeah, because then, like in a school like Yale, they try to break you down, try to make you insecure, and I mean, that works. For the, I mean, that happens for some people, and it takes a long time for them to get out of it. But you have to know within yourself why you're doing it. And you're the, you're the measure, right? You're the only person that you're answering to. You're the only reason. You're the, it's self-generating, right? So there's no one looking over you to see if you, you know, clocked in, clocked out. All people can see is the end result. <laughs>